Thanks very much. It's a great honor to be here and to be chosen to be the keynote speaker this year for the uh, music festival. And really my goal today is to um, raise your awareness about traumatic brain injury, to talk a little bit about the studies that uh, Pete mentioned uh, with respect to uh, this large scale uh, prospective study that we're doing today, talk a little bit about how we're trying to work together and really sort of finish up with a story about why I think we all do what we do. So traumatic brain injury is really as old as mankind. I think since the beginning of mankind, uh, we've all suffered from traumatic brain injury. And I don't know whether you've seen this before, but this is a surgical text that was discovered from uh, 1700 BC, and it's called the William Smith Surgical Papyrus. And it was really the first description of, of traumatic surgery. And in this um, uh, document, they uh, treated 27 cases of head injury. In this document, it was amazing. This has been almost 3,000, 4,000 years ago, and they knew what the brain was. It was actually the first written description of the brain. They also learned a lot about brain function. They described localization where the right side of your brain works the left side of your body. They also knew that if you were uh, sort of knocked out from a head injury and you couldn't speak, that it was likely that you had injury to the left side of your brain, which we now know that the left temporal lobe is where uh, speech resides. But for all of these severe head injuries, they described this as an ailment not to be treated. And this really carried on for the next several thousand years. The Greeks really didn't feel like there was a treatment for traumatic brain injury. The Romans didn't find a treatment for traumatic brain injury. Even in the Middle Ages, uh, there was an occasional burr hole drilled for a trephination, but really this wasn't something that you would treat. Where, where, where General Corelli comes from, these were treated as expectant deaths. Uh, early on in the wars, people really didn't even try to treat these injuries. And then, again, rolling into uh, the 1800s, I don't know how many people have heard of the curious case of Phineas Gage, but Phineas Gage is probably the most uh, famous person in neuroscience, and he suffered a traumatic brain injury. Now, I don't know whether you can see this over here on the left, but um, he's holding a big rod, a tamping rod, and what happened was is that they were tamping explosives, and there was a spark, and this rod went up and went through his left eye and destroyed his left frontal lobe. And uh, he was close to Harvard, they studied him at Harvard, and uh, things were said about him that uh, his friends found him no longer Gage. He was different after he had injured his left frontal lobe. The personality changes, he had poor judgment, he was disinhibited, he often said curse words which he had never done before. And because of this, uh, his company was really unwilling to take him back because he had a personality change as a result of his traumatic brain injury. And it really became clear then at this point in studying this man that the brain and the mind were really one, that you couldn't separate these things and this idea of localization and where brain function really is. And one of the stories that never gets told about uh, uh, Phineas Gage is he actually went to so uh, South America for a while, he worked, he came back, uh, and he actually had quite a bit of recovery. So this is a story of hope, and that even though we were learning about neuroscience from him, over the years he actually got better, but unfortunately, in 1860, he died in San Francisco of an epileptic seizure. And this also highlights that traumatic brain injury is associated not with just understanding the brain better, but with many, many other diseases. So for example, most of what we've learned about brain function comes from injuring the brain. It is a natural experiment that when somebody injures their left temporal lobe, they often are unable to speak again. When we injure the frontal lobes, we have problems with our executive function. It's also an excellent model to understand how the brain rebuilds itself. I have patients all the time that don't move the right side of their body after their traumatic brain injury, and with good rehabilitation and time, they begin to move the right side of their body. How does this happen? This is a natural experiment about how the brain rebuilds itself, and there are neuroscience opportunities, just like there were in 1700 BC, to understand how the brain works. Lots of overlap between traumatic brain injury and depression and post-traumatic stress. We know that post-traumatic stress and TBI are very much entangled. We also know that 50% of the people that have traumatic brain injury go on to develop depression. There's an opportunity to learn about depression here. Alzheimer's, big environmental risk factor for traumatic brain injury. Epilepsy, the number one cause of adult onset epilepsy, traumatic brain injury. 
We don't understand why people spontaneously develop epilepsy, but we might be able to learn about epilepsy from studying our TBI patients that we know that go on to develop epilepsy. Parkinson's. Lots of papers coming out showing an association. Not causation, just association, but there may be a thread there that we can follow. And because it's football season, and we're going to hear a lot about this uh, this fall and more and more over time, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, what is this? Uh, is it something to be concerned about? Yes. Is it something to panic about? I'm not sure. But there's certainly a connection between repetitive head injury and this new type of dementia, which by learning about this, we may learn about other types of dementia. So I see traumatic brain injury not only as a way to understand the brain, but also a way to understand other diseases. So. Traumatic brain injury has many faces. This is probably the face that people are most associated with in the last 10 years, is what's going on in our military. And this is recent data showing that we have 327,000 service members that have sustained a traumatic brain injury. It's a pretty big number. And I had the pleasure to work with General Corelli uh, when he was uh, still active duty. And I really have the most respect for him. I, I can't say enough. You know, where most people in World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, they swept this problem under the carpet. He lifted the carpet up and started kicking up the dust and made sure that everybody understood that traumatic brain injury was important. And one of the reasons why we're as far along as we are today is because of his work. And, and I applaud you, sir. Thank you. Well, it is football season, so uh, we, we can't get away without talking about sports injuries, but there's all kinds of sports injuries. Actually, more kids get hurt riding a bicycle than they do playing football. Uh, so there's a lot of sports injuries that are out there. If you look at the CDC website, uh, it's estimated that 1.6 to 3.8 million sports injuries a year. That's a pretty big number. How about just daily life? Car accidents, texting while walking. Don't do that. I do that sometimes. I've almost had a head injury myself. Um, Work-related accidents. So what we know, and this number goes up every year because our ability to capture this data gets better, is that there's at least 2.5 million people a year seeking medical treatment for a traumatic brain injury. Big numbers. So this next thing may surprise you a little bit. What do you think is the most rapidly growing population of traumatic brain injury patients in this country? Right here. Older Americans. Another little uh, prevention tip. It's great to be riding a bicycle and being physically active when you're older. Wear a helmet. Okay, that's, that, that's not what you want to do. Um, people have called this the silver tsunami. We are going to have millions and millions and millions of older people. And the cancer docs and the heart docs are doing such a great job. We're living longer. We're more active. And guess what's happening? We're falling. We're breaking hips. And we're breaking our heads. People age 65 and older have the greatest rate of hospitalization for TBI. It's not the young people, it's the older people. TBI-related fatality is twice as high if you're over the age of 65. And research is sorely lacking. I went back in preparation for this talk and looked at the research. Less than 1% of the papers pertain to these folks. We've never studied an older patient in a drug trial, even though they failed. We don't know anything about it. And two years ago at my hospital, we flipped. And so now I admit more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 65. And this is just going to keep on growing as we all uh, do well with our heart medications and, and battle cancer and so on. So this is a huge problem. This is the data that's on the website from the CDC. That top line that's going up at a 45 degree angle. That's people over the age of 65. And I have, uh, 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 by, by uh, a colleague at the CDC, says that the next line, that, the next dot that goes on that thing is going to be further up and to the right. So this is, this is something that's on a trajectory that we have to learn more about. So what do we look at traumatic brain injury in 2015? We have a very crude and blunt tool to stratify these patients. We, we, we use this coma score, which was developed 40 years ago, which is good for clinical care, but probably not good for uh, being able to uh, stratify patients. So we use terms like mild and moderate and severe and concussion. Everybody's heard of concussion, but we don't really know what it is. We have 42 definitions, so that means no one absolutely knows. Our outcome measures are equally crude. We use a disability measure that isn't even brain specific, and we use these for all of our drug trials and for terms like vegetative, death, good recovery, et cetera. Let's look at something that's worked. We talked about cancer and why we're living longer and living healthier. You know, if you look at cancer today, you go and you look at something, it's not just a mass, you biopsy it, you look at the pathology, you look at the surface antigens, you look at the genetics, and we have a very precise and detailed treatment right down to the, to the, to the nth degree, and that's why we're making progress with this. 
Where are we with traumatic brain injury in 2015? We separate this on a coma score and we call it mild, moderate, and severe. Can you imagine trying to come up with a treatment for cancer, calling it mild, moderate, and severe? Pete has mild cancer, I have moderate cancer, poor Eric has severe cancer, so he gets the severe cancer drug. This is what we've been doing. This is never going to work. We, we have lumped this together to the point to where there's no precision. So the other way that we've been working, and Pete alluded to this, is we've been working in small groups looking at discrete things. It's, it's, it's sort of the fable of the blind men and the elephant, and you've got all these guys around the elephant, and one group of people here is looking at the imaging, and another group of the people is looking at the proteome. But these things are all part of the same person over here on the left, and I think to artificially split these out is really sort of impaired us in being able to understand this. So some of you may be aware that uh, in January of this year, the Obama administration announced what's called the Precision Medicine Initiative. And it really builds on this idea that we were fortunate to be sort of on the leading edge of this with this study that I'll tell you about shortly, which says that you know we can't understand these things in isolation, that we basically have to look at them at a multi-scalar level if we hope to pluck out different subgroups of patients that might be able to be treated by a particular drug. So really the idea is right now we work at the level of symptoms. The GCS is a symptoms-based exam. But we have tons of imaging, all kinds of really cool developments with PET scanning and MRI scanning and so on and so forth, lots of tools to take advantage of. The clinical data, we're just now learning how to harness all of this rich clinical data. And I know there's a lot of promise for what we're gonna get out on an electronic health record. Uh, as somebody that puts data into the electronic health record, I can tell you that we need you know, a little bit more detailed information than what we currently have. Uh, we have the proteome, uh, the idea of finding blood-based biomarkers for diagnostics and, and to follow treatment. And uh, obviously, a lot of the work that's being done in other communities, such as schizophrenia, in terms of the genetics of these diseases, uh, we can borrow and learn from what they're doing and apply that to, to where we're working here. So this is really a precision medicine approach to understand the problem. The idea then is that if we can build a large uh, precision medicine or knowledge network here, that we can start to look for subgroups of patients beyond just mild TBI. So within this mild TBI group, we may find a group of patients where the symptoms are associated with the imaging and are associated with the proteome, and, and, and this might be group A. And then we may find other patients where it's a little bit more subtle, where in fact there might be uh, an imaging finding that seems to map to different symptoms. And this is really what we're looking for. We're trying to split this group into really treatable subgroups of patients. So our current study that Pete alluded to is called Track TBI, Transforming Research and Clinical Knowledge. And One Mind has been on the ground zero of this. Uh, they co-sponsored an investigator meeting where we pulled all of our previous competitors together and said, let's collaborate, let's not compete against one another, and let's work to get this grant. And so we were awarded this grant uh, not quite two years ago, and we have 11 clinical sites, and then we have many, many additional uh, analytic sites and many collaborators that have come on board since we've started. So the idea here is that we're going to look at 3,000 subjects really across the spectrum from concussion to coma. We're not going to hinge ourselves or tie ourselves to this idea of mild, moderate, or severe. We're going to try to improve the diagnosis and classification in this precision medicine approach. We're going to try to get a better outcome measure so that we can do an effective clinical trial for the outcomes. We're going to really try to understand mild TBI. Most of what we've studied has been severe TBI because it's obvious, and that's certainly what I spend a lot of my time taking care of. But as I'll show you, mild TBI is not mild, and it really, I think, stigmatizes these patients that have this mild TBI to say, oh, well, it's mild. If you can't work, then there's nothing mild about that. Um, and then this idea of creating an information commons uh, to really promote collaboration in and around TBI research to make a difference here. So we've been really fueled not only by the support of one mind, but a very rapidly growing public-private partnership. We have many companies on board, such as Pfizer, GE, Abbott, uh, many biomarker companies, lots of organizations like the NCAA, the CDC has signed on with us, uh, and, and many academic partners. This, as Pete says, this is not me, this is we that's uh, really doing this effort. So uh, as of two days ago, we'd enrolled about 1,136 uh, subjects uh, over a period of probably about 14, 15 months. This uh, is uh, probably a tribute to the incredible investigators we have, but also just the scope of the disease. Uh, you know, if you look at our screening logs, it makes you realize that those numbers that the CD have, CDC has, they're, they're woefully uh, 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 underestimated. There's a lot more TBI out there than we think that there is. 
So we started asking people questions that were important to people. Uh, we, we, we were worried about the fact that, you know, we were treating this like an event and not a process. This has been one of the issues. So they say, oh, well, you had a TBI. We don't ever follow up with these people. This is 11 of the top sites in the country. This is Massachusetts General Hospital. This is Harborview in Seattle. Uh, this is Maryland Shock Trauma. I mean, these are all the big boy trauma centers around the country. And at two weeks when we asked those folks, did you get anything, you know, any educational material about your TBI? No, 44% of them didn't. Did anybody give you any contact information if you were to have symptoms from this? 63% of them didn't get that. Did you get any follow-up? 45%, no follow-up. This is, this is really shameful. We can do a lot better job about this. Not only we're not following them up, we're not even diagnosing them in the emergency department. Studies have shown that we miss half of the mild TBI and concussion that are in our emergency departments. And this is something that Mona Hicks and One Mind are working on, working with the CDC and a number of thought leaders uh, in the emergency medicine community to start getting them to screen for TBI like they do in the NFL and like they do in the military. We can do a better job. Well, how about mild? Is mild TBI mild? We just looked at our outcome data at, uh, at six months. Now, I want to make sure that everybody understands these are all people being brought to a level one trauma center. So these aren't the people that bump their head and go to your community hospital. Paramedics are bringing these people here because there was an accident. Maybe you fell down some steps as opposed to just bumping your head. So there's a selection bias here. I want to make sure people understand that. But even with that, only 44% of the people are fully recovered at six months. This is not what I was taught to tell patients. I was taught to tell somebody that if you had a GCS 13, 14, 15, that only 10 to 15% of these people were gonna have problems. Now that may be true if we look at the population at large, but most of these people are coming in through trauma centers and we're telling them the wrong information. So this is something that we can do to change the practice of medicine right now, which is we can follow these people up and we can, we can tell them that they might expect that things aren't gonna be all rosy by the time that six months comes along. The other thing that we've learned from the military here is the inner sort of the entanglement of post-traumatic stress and TBI. So we tested our patients and did a screening tool. It's the same tool that they use in the military. And we found that 27% of these people screen positive for post-traumatic stress. It's traumatic and stressful if you get hit by a car. It's traumatic and stressful if you fall down a flight of steps. And so, uh, you know, even though this is not in our wheelhouse, we don't talk about uh, post-traumatic stress really in, in, in neurosurgery and look at this. This is where we've got to really embrace the mental health community, work with these folks. We need to be asking people the right questions when they come into the emergency department. And we need to be looking for this at six months or three months because we know that this is really a problem these folks have. Well, how about imaging? I just want to show you a couple of little snippets here. Uh, you probably can't see this very well, but on the top left is a normal head CT. And what you can see here is that th these yellow arrows are pointing to a three Tesla, a three T MRI. Now today, if you were to get a head injury and go down here to the Queen of the Valley, they do a head CT. They did a head CT and they said it's negative. They tell you it didn't have traumatic brain injury, okay? But we found that if you use an MRI, which we all know in neuroscience that MRIs are better than CTs, that's why we developed them, that you see more things. And in fact, what we saw is that a quarter of these patients going to a level one trauma center that have a negative head CT have findings on an MRI, and these findings are predictive of an unfavorable outcome at three months. So if you go to an emergency room and they do a head CT and they say you haven't had a TBI, you might want to say, hey, maybe we should get an MRI because there's more out there to be seen. Blood-based biomarkers, we use this in heart medicine all the time. If you think you're having a heart attack, they'll, they'll look for a protein called troponin. So we're trying to find a troponin for the brain, and we're looking at a protein that many of the basic scientists here will know about, GFAP. That's how we label defined astrocytes. And so it's a very simple idea. If you, if you bruise your brain, you might release this protein in your bloodstream. And sure enough, that's what we found, is that you have more of this protein in your bloodstream if you have a positive head CT. The military is working with Abbott on this to try to develop a point of care device that will not only be used in the military, but can be used in the sports arena, can be used in ambulances to get you to the right hospital. And so there's a lot of promise here as well. So I, what I hope to have done is just give you a little snippet here of how we're building this knowledge network, and I'd be happy to talk to you or answer questions about all the different things that we've, we're doing here. But what I really want to just close with here over the next uh, 10 minutes is, is to really talk to you about how do we heal this injured brain. I don't think that there's a single investigator, institution, funding organization, or private company that can make progress on its own. This is too complicated a problem for one person to solve. So how are we going to solve this? Well, this is what we've been doing. 
We have small data, we have some information, limited knowledge, no treatments, we're all competing you know, for small grants, and we don't really have that sort of uh, large scale effort that I think it's gonna take to solve this problem. <clears throat> So why don't we just simply just share the data? I mean, I think that was a good initial idea and that has worked very well in the genetics community. Uh, uh, but but for, for some reason, it hasn't worked in all communities. And so we saw a lot of barriers to, to just trying to simply share the data. And, and there's other problems with just simply sharing the data. One of them is, um, you know, we, we, we came up a, across a lot of barriers and this was brought up in the uh, One Mind uh, Summit, which was done in 2014. And that's really the data sharing is harder than you think. Most current incentives encourage the hoarding of data. Issues with authorship. All young investigators need to write papers to keep their jobs and to get promoted. They need to be recognized for what they do. You have to have funding oftentimes to support your salary and to be promoted. Publication policies of journals don't always support team science. And there's issues of IP and money. I mean, we want companies to have intellectual property because they have to be able to take things to our patients. We're not gonna do that as investigators. The other issue too is that if you put data into a shared database, oftentimes people take data out of the database and re-silo it. They analyze the data, but this data never comes back and there's issues of being able to verify how, how that data works, so we're trying to work around that. So um, what we're really trying to do is follow really the, the, the mantra of one mind, which is that we want to foster collaboration. We want to accelerate replication results and how to validate these. We want to allow increased data integration to increase the statistical power. And ultimately, we want to accelerate research. So what we've done is really build a collaboration model that's early and open with shared rewards so that everybody gets something out of it. It's not just simply sharing data. We're discussing information and creating knowledge within this group. We now have over 120 investigators that are involved with this. This is one of the largest scale efforts across multiple institutions. People that used to be PIs of grants are now getting 10 or 20 percent. Why are they doing this? Because they know that we have to work together to make a difference. This collaboratory, as we refer to it, is really bound by a lot of documents. You know, we want to make sure that everybody understands what the rules of the sandbox are. So we have our uh, publication authorship, we have data use agreements, we have collaboration agreements, and we have a plan now that will take the data that's analyzed and put it back into the database in a way that the data can be reanalyzed. So if there's a, if there's a, a result that everybody in the community disagrees with, we can go back and look at the source data and the analytic plan and either figure out that they made a mistake or we had an idea that was wrong for the last 20 years. We, we need to be able to reproduce what we're doing to make it real for patients. So one of the things we're doing in the One Mind portal, we built this digital sandbox where all the investigators now are posting ideas, putting in together analytic plans, being reviewed by our statistical team. This is a comparative effectiveness uh, project that we're doing with our colleagues at USC. And you can see this is all getting developed out. All the documents and the analytic plans, they're all there for everybody to see. This is, this is a transparent process within the sandbox. And this is just an example where one of our biomarker guys comes up with a great idea for a health economics project. He's not a health econ economist, but, but he had a really great idea. And what I'm trying to show you here is that by people working together in this digital space, it really is collaboration. It's more than just sharing the data, it's collaborating. So is this working? Well, you know, we've now acquired 11 new data sets because we're trying to learn from the past. Uh, we're gathering new insights in the GOSE. We all thought we were doing it the same way. When we got everybody in the same room, we realized that the primary outcome measure that we used for the last 20 years, we don't do it the same way. That may be one of the reasons why some of these drug trials failed. We wouldn't have known that by just simply sharing the data, which is either one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We knew this by talking to each other. I mean, it, there's, there's, there's something important about collaboration that you get beyond data sharing. We standardized our common data elements into CDIS standards, which will be used for all future FDA trials. So this is a major achievement uh, in changing the way that we do clinical trials in TBI. Also with MRI scanning, we standardized for the first time diffusion imaging. This is a technique that there's over 9,000 papers in, and nobody ever standardized this across all three vendors, and we've done that as part of this study. And we're attracting new uh, academic and corporate partners all the time. So this is a work in progress many bugs to work out. This is version 0 0.1 and we have a lot of new things to do. We need to prove that collaboration is better than competition and we need to create a sustainable model. One mind needs to be supported to help to support us. We need this neutral zone to work in. If this were a Harvard effort or a UCSF effort or a UCLA effort, you know, people would start getting tribal. But, but by being a nonprofit in one mind, this is really helping us to facilitate this. This is really the grease that helps to make this work. So if you'll just give me a couple more minutes, I want to tell you why I'm doing this and why we should be doing this. 
Shortly after 9-11, I was on call and I got a call from the emergency department uh, where they told me that there was a young woman down there that had just been on what we call a rollover MVA, a, a motor vehicle accident where it rolled over. And you can look at this, uh, this truck here and you can see the whole front of it where the driver, this young woman was, is, is absolutely crushed in. We get this horrible looking CT scan that shows that she's got brain shift, which means that she's gonna die very, very quickly if we don't get her to the operating room and take this bone off and get rid of this clot. So she goes to the operating room. This is called a decompressive hemicraniectomy. And this is really what temporized and saved many of our soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. Because we don't have a treatment for brain swelling per se, we take the bone off and let the brain swell itself. And this is what we did for this, uh, this patient. She then went to the ICU where she began to have tremendous problems with her brain pressure. Her brain, despite the fact we took the bone off, continued to swell. She had bruised her heart, so we couldn't give her some of the heart pressure medicines that we normally would to get her blood pressure up. And then her brain pressure started going up again. And we went down and we got another CT scan. And what we saw here, and I don't know where you can make this out, but there's a big clot that's blossomed, a hemorrhage that's blossomed in her left temporal lobe. Well, I was taught as a resident that you should never mess with the left temporal lobe because this is where speech is. If you basically operate on somebody, you're gonna leave them with the inability to speak and you're really better off just not to operate on them. And I was taught when people had an issue like this that we shouldn't operate on them. And in fact, that's no different than the William Smith Papyrus from 1700 BC. This was an ailment not to treat. So I don't wanna to get too emotional here, but I went to examine her before I went out to give the bad news to the family that we needed to withdraw support, that we weren't gonna be able to get her through this. And for those of you who've ever been in an ICU when people are comatose, what happens sometimes is we put these splints in their hands to keep their hands open. And so I went to examine her and I wanted to see what her motor function was. And when I opened up her hand, I saw that there was uh, not a splint in there, but a very small pair of socks. And the, um, the, the, the nurse told me, she said, uh, yeah, this, this woman has an 11, 11 month old boy. So I went out to the uh, family and I said, uh, well, you know, here's what we know. I mean, I've been taught that you never mess with a clot in the temporal lobe. And I think if we take this out, um, you know, she's probably never gonna speak again. And, uh, but, but you know, I told them that I just saw these little socks. <laughs> I just, I don't know that I can just myself go in there and not, not treat this person. So we took her to the operating room. We took this clot out of her left temporal lobe, which uh, many of my colleagues said, well, you really shouldn't do that. That's what we were taught. And I said, I know. And this is Crystal now as she's basically recovering. You can see that she's got the decompressive hemicraniectomy. She had a degloving injury of her left arm. This is her as she's starting to recover. You can see the divot. And if you ever see pictures of soldiers, this is what happens when you take the bone flap off. And this is Crystal when she visited the ICU now 14 years later, a couple of months ago and she's back to work. She has seizures, but unlike Phineas Gage, we can treat these seizures today because we know a little bit more about it. And so I think what this woman tells us here, we really don't know a whole lot about traumatic brain injury and really about brain function. I think many of the things that we know are probably wrong, and there's an urgent need to accelerate research so we can really figure out how to heal the injured brain. And with your help, I think we can do that. We've got all the parts together, we just need more support. And I appreciate your time and attention this morning and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.